Our second scripture reading today opens with the love of God, which helps us to pray and ends with the love of God. Listen for the promise at the end. We read from Romans chapter eight. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. Let us truly hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and let our hearts be open to these words. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, out of all the words which are spoken this day, out of all the words which are sung, out of all the words which are heard, may it be Your living Word that remains and abides with us through the power of the Spirit and in the name of the Christ we pray. And let us together say, Amen. Well, it's baseball season, and I'm enjoying the Minnesota Twins playing just well enough to stay within striking distance of first place so far. It's totally unexpected this year. And I'm enjoying the slugging of Miguel Sano. I'm enjoying the jaw-dropping speed of Byron Buxton roaming center field, taking hits away left and right. Well, baseball has always had its characters. It's had its characters. I'm of the generation that remembers New York Yankees catcher and Hall of Famer Yogi Berra. What a great name, Yogi Berra. He was indeed a, a colorful personality known for mangling the English language, saying such things as, it ain't the heat, it's the humility. Or, you better cut that pizza into four pieces because I'm not hungry enough to eat six. Yogi Berra. Well, one time, there was a ball game that Yogi Berra was, was playing catcher in, and it was a tie game, and uh, uh, it was in the bottom of the ninth inning, and the batter for the opposing team came into the batter's box, and he took this batter, took his bat, and made the sign of the cross on home plate. And Yogi Berra, also a Catholic, took his glove and wiped off home plate, and said, why don't we just let God watch this game? <laughs> Prayer. Prayer. In our scripture today, the Apostle Paul says something that's astounding, for Paul anyway. He says, we do not know how to pray as we ought. We do not know how to pray as we ought. This is from the Apostle Paul, who knew, who seemed to know everything about everything, who 
had his opinions and he was rock solid on those. But, you know, think about those words. We do not know how to pray as we ought. As a pastor through the years, I've had plenty of people asking me questions about prayer. Questions like, should baseball players or football players ask for God to help them win? Or questions like, when we pray, how do we know that we're not just really talking to ourselves? Or questions like, if God is infinite, then why does the infinite God, the the Creator God of all the universe, care about my tiny little concerns, comparatively speaking? Or, does prayer work? But prayer is primarily relationship with God. It's primarily relationship with God. And so in our scripture today, we read this whole verse. Paul says, For the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes for us with sighs, with groans, too deep for words. Yes, sometimes, friends, we pray with our minds. Usually we pray with our minds. We we pray with our words. I pray plenty with my words, sometimes with many words, sometimes with few words. Actually, Jesus tends to caution us about praying with too many words because we can start to look holier than thou. But there are plenty of times when... I find that I pray with my sighs, or I pray with my groans, maybe some simple relief and I go, ah, or maybe it's encountering great wonder, like seeing the Pacific Ocean once again, and I go, ah, the Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Or maybe it's encountering great tragedy, such as when I walked the grounds of Dachau just a couple of summers ago, and you can't do anything at times but groan. The Spirit intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. It's a part of our prayer life. Well, the Apostle Paul doesn't shy away from tragedy. He says this in our Scripture today, For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. You know, that verse is not saying that all things are good. I get angry when I hear people use this this verse to kind of put rose-colored glasses on as if everything is hunky-dory, everything is wonderful. When a, the six-year-old son of friends of ours fell through some bleachers at his brother's hockey game and hit his head and died, there was nothing good about that. We found our hearts breaking, and our hearts still break. Or when we see hundreds of thousands of Syrians dying in a brutal civil war with a brutal regime, there's nothing good about that. Our hearts break. Our hearts break. No, this verse does not say that all things are good. It says that that all things work together for good for those who love God. Now, I've, I've struggled with this. I've prayed about this. I've, I've thought about this for, for years. And, and the thing that helps me understand this, for we know that all things work together for good, is something that Martin Luther King said. And he was saying this in the context of the Christian faith, in the, concept, uh, in the context of, of there being life and there being life after death. So he was talking about that whole trajectory there. And Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. 
The arc of the moral universe is law, but it bends toward justice. And I would add that it bends toward compassion. It bends toward truth. It bends toward healing. It bends toward reconciliation. We know that it's not that way all the time. Sometimes we look around ourselves and we say, is it ever going to be this way? Does the arc of the universe really bend toward compassion, toward truth, toward hope? We look at the world sometimes and say, is that true at all? And yet we keep believing, yet we keep working, yet we keep praying. Because, you know, this is a statement of faith. And we are people of faith after all. Yes, we believe at some deep level that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purposes. Now, just a footnote to that. We finite human beings cannot judge. We are not to be judges of those who love God and those who do not. God's got some surprises up the divine sleeve, you see. We are not to judge. Okay, next in the Scripture today from Romans, Paul goes on and says, For those whom God foreknew, those whom God had foreknowledge of, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son, And those whom God predestined, God also called. And those whom God called, God also justified. And those whom God justified, God also glorified. And there's so much there to unpack. I mean, we could spend sermon after sermon after sermon on that. But let's get to the nub of what sticks in our minds so often. And that is the theological concept of predestination. It's, it's kind of a prickly thing to, to try to get your, your hands around, your mind around. Predestination, the, the, the concept that God has predestined some to be saved, and the corollary of that is that there are some who are predestined not to be saved. And so, if that's all decided, by God before we are born or, or after we're born, then why do we pray? Why do we worship? Why do we love God? Why do we come around the campfire and sing, I have decided to follow Jesus? If it's all decided who's saved and who's not before we're born, then why? What happens to human freedom? What happens to our free will as human beings? What happens to our outpouring of love? What happens to our stepping out in faith by the grace of God? Let me be clear. We do not believe in predestination. I think of it this way because I still try to take these words of Scripture seriously. I think of of it this way. And it's a humble illustration, so bear with me, but... But when we die and go to heaven and go to see the gates of heaven, we'll see perhaps the words above the gate of heaven from Jesus, from Matthew chapter 11, words that say, Come all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then when you go in through those gates and look back at that sign, you'll see the words on the other side of the sign, also from Jesus, also from the Gospel of Matthew, words that say, Come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What this is saying, I believe, is that yes, our human free will matters profoundly. Our response of love to God by the grace of God matters profoundly. And that yes, God has prepared a banquet for all God's children to enjoy from the foundation of the world. And so we keep praying, we we keep giving of ourselves, we keep worshiping, we keep serving others in Jesus' name. 
Because we're called to live into that in the here and the now. Eternal life is now with God in Christ and continues through life and, and after death and into life after death. Would you join up with that Jesus movement? Or would you recommit yourself to that Jesus movement? We get to do that together as God's children. All right, finally, Paul then moves on to say, for what can separate us from the love of Christ? I mean, this is from a man who had been shipwrecked, a man who had been imprisoned, a man who had been whipped for his faith. What can separate us from the love of Christ, he says? Can hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us, he said. And then he says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, this is what I live for. This is, this is what I stake my life on. This love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the Christ we get to share with our neighbors all around. This is why we've launched into being a reconciling and welcoming church for all God's children. This is why we've launched into these missional church consultation initiatives. Some are really easy and some are not so easy, but we've taken that step to launch into them. This is why we've launched into being a, a church of two campuses to share this Christ with others from the mother campus, from the new campus. We get to do that because I am sure that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And those are words for life and death and life after death. There are words for right now for you and I. Let me tell you just a little vignette as I close of how these words really came home in my life. Many of you know that my wife Kay had a stroke in December. And thank you so much for your prayer. She has come back so far. She still has stiffness in her elbow and, and shoulder on her left side. And, and she still has very little movement of her fingers, which is really hard on her left side because she's a marvelous pianist and organist. But through the wonderful help of therapists, she's making measurable steps forward. I think that's the word that one of our nurses shared with me, measurable outcomes. And we're so thankful. Well... When Kay went into the emergency room at Abbott Northwestern Hospital just before midnight on December 21st, her Lutheran pastor at the church where she is the music director met us there. And Jeff talked with us and then asked if we could hold hands and pray and asked if he could put his hand on Kay's forehead. And as he prayed in that time of utmost not knowing what would come next, I felt the presence of God. And I knew this verse to be deeply true. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so as we close, because we're in the midst of this journey of discipleship together, this journey of following Jesus together, this journey of being sisters and brothers together, as we close, I invite you now to close your eyes. And I invite you to put your hand on your forehead. And I invite you to repeat each phrase after me out loud. For I am convinced... That neither death nor life, nor height nor depth, nor things present nor things to come, 
will be able to separate us. Will be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.